Welcome everybody watching on YouTube to another speedrun episode. Hopefully we get a couple of high quality games in. Let's continue our tradition of starting with a 10 minute game and then we'll go from there. Okay, so we hit 1300 in the previous speedrun episode. As of the time of recording, I haven't decided yet whether I wanna publish it on YouTube or not, but we'll see. We have the black pieces here and another Sicilian. Okay, so Knight to C3 which is the gateway, of course, to many, many different kinds of anti-Sicilians. And actually not necessarily, of course, white can follow this up by developing the other knight and then transitioning back into the open Sicilian with d4. But typically people who play this move uh, are signaling that they want to play a Grand Prix attack or a Magnus Sicilian, which got popular recently, Levy recommended it, uh, or a whole host of other anti-Sicilians. So our move here is d6. We face this plenty of other times in the speed run. And the point is that you choose your second move based on what you play in the open Sicilian. If you're a Nidor player, you play D6. If you're a Sveshnikov player or an accelerated dragon player, you play the move Knight to C6. Okay, so Bishop B5 check is one of those sort of second tier anti-Sicilians, which are not really bad per se, right? How can a move like Bishop B5 check be a serious mistake? Well, it can't, but it's also not a particularly threatening check. Now, what's funny is that in the previous episode, again, which I probably will publish, but I might not, we faced the Moscow variation, which is the same position, but with a knight on f3 instead of c3. So you might wonder what the development of the knight to c3 changes and what it essentially does, well, two things. There's, there's two reasons that knight c3 is a little bit inferior to knight f3. The first is that white doesn't have this very typical plan of c3 followed by d4. And the second is that d4 is now a little bit harder to achieve because this square is now only controlled by the queen. So our, our choice here uh, is pretty vast. Knight c6, knight d7, and bishop d7 are all pretty acceptable, but I think it's in line with my recommendation against the Moscow variation to put the knight on d7. So I'm recommending knight d7 against uh, knight f3, d6, bishop b5 check, so there's no real reason for us to, uh, to look for adventures. Okay, so d3 will follow up by developing the knight. Let's go knight f6. And as I explained in my analysis kind of my, my general overview to the Moscow variation game, you don't necessarily want to rush uh, the move a6 because this bishop on b5 isn't really bothering you and it's it's not really curtailing your scheme of development, which, um, you know, you can follow through on in several different ways. You can fianchetto the bishop. I really like to go e6 and build up this pawn wall just like we did in the Moscow variation game. In fact, I think we have the exact same position by transposition. I think this is exactly how that game went. Knight f3, d6, bishop b5, knight d7. And I want to say that our opponent did exactly the same thing, like knight c3 followed by d3. And we might have even reached this exact position. Um, okay. So our opponent continues to play, let's call them like non-threatening moves. It's pretty clear to me the idea of this move is probably to prepare b4. And that's actually not something that I really want to allow. There's no reason for for us to allow white to kind of expand on the queen side. And there's a very kind of sleek way in which we can prevent b4. Uh, remember that on a sort of high level, there's type one and type two prophylaxis. Prophylaxis is the art of um, thwarting your opponent's positional and tactical threats. Type one prophylaxis is what I call physical prophylaxis, where you literally are physically preventing a certain move from appearing on the board. But type two prophylaxis is where you allow the move to happen but you are preparing some sort of response. You take the sting out of it. So you ask yourself, well, what's the drawback of the move before? And one of the things it does is it weakens the knight on c3. So you might say, well, let's go queen a5. But queen a5 is really awkward because white's going to go bishop d2. A much um, more mature decision is to go queen to c7 because the queen is very well placed on this square. We are going to play a6 eventually, so we're not worried about a knight jumping to b5. And now b4 is met with c takes b4, and the queen, of course, is x-raying the knight. Bishop to d2, so white reinforces the threat of b4. Now I think it's a great time to play a6 and force white to put their cards on the table. Now white has to make a decision between taking the knight, which I'm anticipating, and dropping the bishop back, which allows us to expand in a very typical Sicilian fashion. This is exactly what we're going to do, b5. And you can see that white's play kind of lacks a lot of meaning. Our opponent has played very passively. We've gotten everything we want on the queen side. Now it's a good idea to complete our development in, in due course. Let's start with bishop to b7. Uh, the reason I'm starting with this particular bishop is I want to discourage white from reopening the center with d4. 
Not that that would be a scary option. It would basically lead to like a really, really comfortable night orb structure. But if you can take away certain options that might be unpleasant, it's a good idea to do so. The center is closed, so there's no big rush for us to get the king out of the center. There's nothing that can really happen to our ultra, ultra solid pawn structure. This is one of the good things about it. We're going to follow up with bishop b7. Okay, a4. Obviously hitting the pawn on b5. Another non-threatening move. Uh, let's respond to it with the straightforward b4, pushing away the knight. I'm expecting the knight to drop back to e2. And actually here, we can play very straightforwardly with bishop e7, or we can try to play a little bit more ambitiously. My gut feeling is that white's play has been really, really passive. I mean, really passive. Everything's kind of clumped together on the first two or three ranks. It's probably a good idea to look for something a little bit more ambitious than bishop e7. And when you hear the words a little bit more ambitious, you should already be kind of thinking at least partially about the move that I'm going to play. Um, ambitious can mean many different things. It can refer to an attack on your opponent's king, but here clearly the king is pretty safe. But it can also mean trying to open the center, which is probably like the best way, the textbook way, to give more meaning to the fact that your pieces are better placed than your opponent's pieces. As long as the center remains closed, there's no direct contact between the forces, your opponent's bad piece placement isn't as clearly pronounced. The moment the center opens up, all hell breaks loose. Okay, so bishop f4 instantly. Our opponent clearly was expecting d5. And your instinct here might be bishop d6. There's nothing wrong with that move. It doesn't blunder a fork because we're defending the square three times. But if you look a little bit carefully and if you're patient, we actually have a way to win material here. We have a way to win material here, and that's by playing e5, hitting the bishop, and we're also hitting the pawn on e4. And it's actually already the beginning of the end. So this is all about avoiding automatic thinking, right? Bishop d6 is a super easy move to make in like one or two seconds. But you always just have to pause, because as long as this pawn is hanging, you know that um, this position is ripe in tactical opportunities. OK, so now the bishop has to move. And actually, once the bishop moves, we reach a pretty instructive situation where I think Black's best move, believe it or not, is not d takes e4, which might sound crazy to you. And it's a good idea to kind of already try to figure out why in your head. So figure out what's wrong with the move d takes e4. Like what unpleasant response does white have? And how would you improve on this move? Very good. So I'm going to play c4. The reason is it's a good idea to shut out this bishop. Why is it a good idea to shut out this bishop? Because the moment we play d5, you should have noticed that now, in the event that this pawn moves away, the bishop makes contact with f7, which is worrisome as long as you haven't castled. And so bishop g3, d takes c4, allows knight f3 to g5. And suddenly, it's not that easy to defend this pawn. So that is why. There we go. We play the move c4. This move is simpler than it looks. Now, white can play dc. That doesn't really change anything. dc will respond dc. The bishop will be pushed away to a2. And then we can safely grab the pawn with our knight. And as a nice little bonus, uh, we now establish a c5 square, which we can use to maximize the development of our dark skirt bishop. We can also castle queenside, by the way, in certain situations. If the d file opens up, we can target white's queen. Now, something really interesting happens if white drops the bishop back straight away, like bishop a2 in this position. Um, we have several options, but I think we'll go for the simple d takes e4. Actually, wait a second. I'm exploring a really interesting alternative option. Yeah, and I think this alternative option would have won the game. It'll remain behind the scenes, so dc, dc, bishop to a2, and knight takes e4. So maybe you're wondering, well, why aren't we taking with the bishop to try to then take the knight on f3 and ruin white's kingside pawn structure? Okay, well, never mind. White gives up the bishop instead. I'll explain that after the game. Now, you should always keep an eye out, keep your eyes peeled for sudden tactics. As long as your king is in the center and one or both of the center files are open, that's a clear sign that, you know, you should be on the lookout for unexpected tactics. Here's one of them. If white instead had castled on, e on, uh, on the king side, ask yourself what you would have done with black. And I'm curious how many of you would have blundered by playing knight takes e4 in that position. Um, you can pause the video and figure out the meaning behind what I just said. Um, but I'll demonstrate this after the game. Bishop takes e5. So 
again, here we have a pretty vast choice of different uh, winning procedures. I think the by far the simplest is to simplify um, and just to grab this bishop. Notice that the d7 square is protected. It's safely protected by the knight. And now we grab the pawn of the queen. Um, there's two, re three reasons behind this. The first is we're simplifying, which is almost always good. The second is that we're grabbing the bishop pair. And the third is that we are opening up the d file. So we're clearing the obstacles on the d file, which will allow us to stick a rook on d8. And this is very unpleasant because the queen doesn't have that many appetizing squares. The game is essentially over. It's just a matter of a couple accurate moves. All right, there we go. So let's start with rook d8, pushing away the queen and undoing the contact between the white queen and the knight on e2, which means that white is now no longer going to be able to castle kingside and the king is going to be stranded in the center. Now, what I just said may sound inaccurate. You might say, well, after the queen moves, um, white can still castle kingside because if we grab this knight on e2, the queen and the king will get pinned after rook e1. But um, I've anticipated that. And you can prevent that from happening with what very astute move. What, and this is a simple move on the surface, but its concept behind it is a little bit more advanced. Type 2 prophylaxis. Not, well, yeah, bishop e7 is excellent, but even, even more accurate than that is the move. This is hard. I mean, it's hard to figure out why this move actually works. It's bishop to c5. Yeah, very good. People got it. Castles kingside, queen takes e2, rook e1, and then we can grab the pawn on f2 with check and eliminate the rook. I think if I had to make a prediction, this actually might happen. Of course, pinned pieces protect, right? PPP. There we go. So king takes f2 is not a legal move. King takes f2 is not legal here. Sometimes it's easy to hallucinate that when you're calculating in your head. You're like, wait, but the queen is pinned. Yeah, but the king cannot move into check under any circumstances. And now we take the rook and we win the game. And that's it. Queen takes e1. We can just trade queens or we can take the knight. Whatever floats your boat. Knight takes e1. We have maiden one. Yeah, we can take the queen. We can take the knight. It, it really doesn't matter. That's it. And now trade queens. Get the king out of the way. And activate your 500 extra pieces. Rook h8, just fighting for the file. Rook e2. I mean, I don't, I don't care about pawns. Notice that I'm like putting much, much higher premium on getting your extra pieces activated as quickly as possible. And now, of course, rook d1 check. You could drop the rook back to d2, but when you can eliminate your opponent's final piece, you should, because then it's very easy to win fast. Which is a good tip for low time situations. Now, just slide the rook over and ladder checkmate by pushing the spawn. All right. So, pretty nice game, I thought, and a good illustration of how quickly things can go wrong. Even when the situation looks kind of very peaceful, it doesn't seem like our opponent did anything too wrong, but as soon as the center opens up, um, you know, the rotten fundamentals of your opponent's position make their presence felt, as they did here. Of course, bishop f4 was a major culprit. So let's clarify a couple of couple of things. Again, we're still pretty pretty early in the 10 minute speed run. So I don't want to jump the gun and give you like a dry academic, I want to say academically constipated theoretical overview, but just to give you a sense of like what we can expect in this position. The Magnus Sicilian is the move d4. People were asking about that in the chat. And it's called that, well, obviously because Magnus had a time period a couple of years ago where he was playing this extensively. It wasn't played by Magnus Carlsen first. It was first played in 1904 by a guy named Horace Cheshire. No relation to the Cheshire Cat, I think. Next, it was played in 1970. So it was played many times before Magnus was born. But often openings are named not by the player who played them first, but um, sometimes that's the case. But often they're named after the player who uh, introduced the most sort of theoretical value into the development of the line. The Nidorf is a great example of this. Nidorf was not the first person to actually play the Nidorf. This position first occurred uh, in a game featuring Savelli Tartakauer, also a very famous player. Nidorf was like the fifth or the sixth player to do this, but he understood its value. Um, just a little bit of fun trivia. So d4, cd, queen takes d4 is a very strange looking line. 
because you're like, well, what's the point of exposing the queen like this? Well, the point is the queen actually drops back to d2. Another very awkward looking move, if you're not acquainted with this line, you might have been expecting bishop to b5, which is kind of an unfortunate mashup of several variations. There is a line called the check over Sicilian, where white plays queen takes d4, also very popular in recent years. And here, indeed, the main line is to play bishop to b5 and exchange the bishop for the knight. Also not very dangerous for black. And by the way, my recommendation here is actually knight to f6. Um, hopefully, we'll get this at least once. With the knight on c3, the ideas are completely different. And after queen to d2, white actually fianchettos the dark squared bishop. And if you don't know what to do, this is a really dangerous line. Most people who have this with black, what move like would you default to? You know, what is your instinct here as black? Somebody who doesn't really know the theory here. Like, what is, what is your gut feeling about what black should do? So most people, they actually play g6. They think that they need to fianchetto the bishop. And sometimes people try to move bishop to h6. They feel that they need to chase away the queen. I actually don't really like this particular setup. Black can equalize here, but it gets really, really tricky. Um, I think black is a much easier way to neutralize this line, and that's to quickly push e6 and d5. So you play knight f6, white plays b3, you play e6, Chevenne and Gen style. But this time the point is after bishop b2, you don't just like passively go bishop e7, you actually play the immediate d6, d5. Uh, trying to punish white for taking so many liberties uh, in the opening. So white has to take, black takes back with a pawn. And typically white castles queenside. This is sort of the main line. This is probably in Levy's course. Now black defends the pawn with bishop e6 and covers the e-file. Now the sort of topical move that Hikaru has played and Fabiano has played is just to slide the king over to b1, just getting the king kind of out of the danger zone. And now black deploys the queen with queen a5. And I really think this position is much easier to play for black. Now white has to know the move knight to b5, initiating the queen trade. If white sleeps through this moment and plays sort of a, a standard move like knight f3, after bishop b4, white is in huge trouble because this knight is under very serious fire. So knight to b5 for this reason, 11 games in the database. This is still pretty well known. The queen trade occurs. And now one Last important subtlety, you have to know the move bishop to b4, developing with tempo. And obviously, you are not afraid of this check, because after king to d7, I mean, both of these pieces are hanging, and the knight is unable to get out in this situation. White loses the game. Um, rookie 2 was played by Alexei Shirov and Gawain Jones. But after Long Castle, I think only black can be better. Just look at the piece activity. Look at how uncoordinated white is uh, on the king side. I mean, white can start developing with knight f3. But now we can pin the other knight with bishop g4 and make things really, really difficult for white. Now, some of you who you know, have a course that, that recommends this line, whether Levy's course or some other course, you can tell me exactly what uh, the recommendation is. This is not a, a comprehensive analysis, but I just wanted to spotlight this line uh, because it does cause a lot of problems for people. It's kind of similar uh, to what we faced in the game. Okay, so uh, some other things that you should be aware of here, of course, the Grand Prix attack with f4. And by the way, the Grand Prix attack, um, the move order is to start with knight c3 because if white starts with f4, and we've faced this many times, it allows the extra option d5, which immediately solves all of black's problems. So the Grand Prix is definitely a very dangerous line uh, that you should know. Here I recommend a Fianchetto-based approach. And there's an old school system called the Close Sicilian, not very popular nowadays, but also something that should be on your radar we have faced it several times through the speedruns. And here I also recommend a Fianchetto-based approach that I call, well, not I don't call it this way, uh, that's called the Botvinnik setup. And the Botvinnik setup is where you Fianchetto your bishop and put the knight on e7 so as not to obstruct the bishop's control of the long diagonal. And it's based on imposing this control over the dark squares and then initiating a pawn storm on the queen side. More on this later, of course. Let's get to the game continuation. So. We face bishop b5 check. We decided on knight d7. And white played d3, which immediately is, you know, a clear sign that white is not playing this, uh, you know, out of a desire to, like, punish us for, for playing the Sicilian. Probably white's best bet um, is to play d4 and try to transpose back into some position resembling the Moscow variation. Uh, we're going to take on d4. Now we play a6. 
And those of you who've seen the previous speedrun episode, uh, this position should ring a bell. Uh, if white plays the move knight f3, we get a very, very similar position um, to the one that I was kind of describing uh, with knight f3, d6, bishop e5. Here, the main move is, in fact, to play d4 as well. c takes d4, queen takes d4. Uh, we had this position in the analysis to yesterday speedrun. And there are some differences between the knight being on c3 and the knight being on f3, but long story short, it's the same kind of structure. Black plays a6, white plays bishop takes d7 check, bishop takes d7. And if white plays knight c3, we could potentially get exactly the same position. Actually, double checking if what I just said is true. Yes, we literally transpose to the exact same position uh, we could have reached in the game. And here, I already forget what I recommended. I, I, I don't know if I actually looked at this line. I feel like I recommended knight f6, but now I'm looking at this position and I think e5 is actually best. Um, anyways, you can go back and check, and I'm sure we'll get more chances to explore these lines in depth. Um, but in any case, our opponent plays d3, and now we have absolutely no problems. Knight f6, knight f3, e6, a3, queen c7, important resource to keep in mind, x-raying the knight, bishop d2, a6. And I actually think this was a serious mistake by white. White definitely should not allow this queenside expansion. Um, white should definitely take on d7. Um, you shouldn't play these lines if you're unwilling to give up the bishop pair. We would have taken back with the bishop. And of course, white is slightly worse here. Castles, we can play b5, so we can basically do exactly what we did in the game, but at least white is able to get pieces to decent squares. Then we can park the bishop on c6, um, complete the kingside development, and start aiming for continual queenside expansion and the like. White played bishop a4, and of course the decisive mistake I think, is the move bishop f4. Uh, this is a clear example of one move-itis. White kind of gets a rush from attacking the queen, but forgets that we can push e5. Now, very quickly, uh, just to showcase this on the board, d takes e4, knight g5 is what I was referring to. Um, the pawn on f7 is very hard to defend. So for that reason, we start with c4. And I wanted to ask people, before we turn to the next game, what would be your response in this position, bishop a2? What do you think is the best move? Is a Slight trick question. This is a pretty advanced question. And there is a clear correct answer here. And it's not what you might think. Let's see who can decipher the meaning of what I just asked. So I'll let people put some moves in the chat. Okay, so the majority opinion should be D takes E4. This is what I would expect most of you to think. Um, some of you are suggesting bishop d6, but remember, this is not a move that carries a threat, and so this gives white a chance to simply, like, take on d5 and black's position, black's pawn chain collapses. Um, you should be thinking d takes e4, because if white plays d takes e4, we literally get the same position that we could have gotten in the game, right? In the game, white took on c4, and then white gave up the bishop for some reason. Had white dropped the bishop back, we would have taken on e4. However, in this position... White has an extra resource. It's incredibly unpleasant and very hard to see. And that's the move knight takes e5. Comes out of nowhere, and suddenly after d4, it ain't that easy to prove that black has a big advantage because this knight is going to be recovered with tempo. So you might say, well, what about bishop d6? Let's give up the knight, but recover a pawn. Well, black is, of course, much, much better here, but it's not as convincing as it could be because the bishop re-enters the game with bishop takes e4. For this reason, black's best move is this crazy move b3, reaching really an amazing example of triple pawn tension. But the point of this move is pretty straightforward. If white plays c takes b3, you, you take the other pawn c takes d3. And this is kind of a classic example of undermining. That's really what it is. You're undermining uh, the c2 pawn so that you can pick up the d3 pawn. But the pawn that you're really trying to undermine is the e4 pawn. This is the final prize, because when all is said and done, this move comes with a fork. Um, if white refuses to engage, that's not going to change anything. You can still take on c2. Um, although maybe here white can play queen takes c2. But okay, here you can play d takes e4. And the difference is that in this position, black actually has several ways to keep an extra piece. Knight d3 check is one, but you also have this additional resource, a check on a5, unpinning the knight. Why do you have this resource? Because when you played the move b3, you opened up this check. 
really cool uh, tactical complications, but they remain behind the scenes. And finally, I just wanted to mention bishop takes e4. Um, you should not overestimate the impact of uh, ruining your opponent's pawn structure. Uh, giving up the monster of a light squared bishop is absolutely not worth it for black because you're going to have long-term problems defending the c4 pawn and why hand over the bishop pair in a wide open position. So we would have taken with a knight. But our opponent decided to give up the bishop and the rest was straightforward. Oh yeah, there was this one trick where I would have actually castled with white and knight takes c4 runs into this and this, picking up the queen and recovering the lost piece. So you should always keep your eyes peeled when your king is in the center and either the D or the E files are open. There's always going to be some tricks hiding below this surface. So here I would have played bishop takes E4, just castled queen side. A lot of different ways to avoid that. Okay, let's do one more 10 plus 0 game. And we playing Hrach from Armenia. Let's go E4. Good luck to our opponent. And we're going to get an Alapin. It's been a while. Okay, so G6. One of many uh, second tier responses to the Alapin. I would consider the two top tier responses to be d5 along with knight f6. e6 is also very popular and a uh, pretty enticing option if you also play the French. But g6 is a uh, pretty decent move. It was played by Hikaru against Gukesh in the candidate, so it's a pretty reputable sideline. Now, our response, of course, is very straightforward. We push d4. Black typically takes on d4. Okay, e6 is already a clear sign that our opponent is kind of at a loss. Now, you've heard me say many times that in the Sicilian, you should be very careful about combining the moves e6 and g6. And the caveat is that when the center is closed, so like if white plays the closed Sicilian, it's typically fine to do that. When the center is open or is about to get opened up, these two moves create massive weaknesses on the dark squares in the center uh, that can hurt you in many, many different ways. Now, what should be our response to this move? Well, some of you might be very tempted to start pushing pawns. Let's go d5, let's punish black. But the best way to punish your opponent is through patience, through cold-blooded patience. Uh, we don't have the firepower to do anything super concrete. We should give black the rope, the rope that, that they need. And so let's just patiently develop. Let's play knight f3. If we had pushed d5, black would have traded and then gone d6 and essentially reached kind of like a Benoni structure, which is not all that impressive. Um, also, d5 is counterproductive because it closes down the center, and we want to keep the center at least partially open, or we want to keep the possibility of d takes c5 uh, available. Okay, so b6. Let's continue along the same lines. Let's continue patiently developing and awaiting our opportunity to cash in our chips. Several ways that we could proceed here. Bishop to g5 uh, may be tempting for some of you. I don't love that move because after bishop e7, you're just kind of helping black develop their king side. I'm noticing that bishop b7 is very likely on the next move. So I really like to develop the light squared bishop to d3 in these kinds of positions. Very nice harmonious square. Uh, if you're a London system player, this should also appeal to you. And let's just continue developing by castling. Bishop b7 is a very awkward move. Now, I mentioned that we should keep our eyes peeled for an opportunity to, to start cashing in our chips. I think that opportunity has arrived. And those of you who have watched a lot of the Alapin videos, you should already have like a pretty good intuition of, of how to proceed here. Now, I'm not talking about bishop h6, which is a move that is really easy to overestimate. Um, it appeals to some of you because you're preventing black from castling. But first of all, bishop h6, black can respond with knight to g4. And the bishop can slide up to g7 only to get trapped after rook g8. Simply preventing your opponent from castling is not such a big achievement in and of itself. There's a much better way to proceed, and you should be a lot more focused on what's going on in the center. Um, some of you might have been hyper-focused on pushing d5, but what do you do if black plays knight f6 in this position on move two? Well, you push e5. That's also a very typical advance in the Alapin. The fact that black hasn't fianchetto the light squared bishop tells me that I would really, really love to put my own light squared bishop on e4, which is a theme uh, and a concept I've talked about at length, when your opponent procrastinates with the, fi with the fianchetto, putting your own bishop on that long diagonal can be really effective. And so e5, I think, is almost winning, believe it or not. Because after knight d5, we have 
something resembling a forced win. Yeah, I think we have a forced win after 95. We're not going to put the bishop on h6 at all. Well, obviously, we want to play bishop b4, and we can play it immediately. But we can also do this uh, in a more decisive manner by first pushing the knight out of d5 with c4. Now we put the bishop on e4. Notice that d5 we on passant. <laughs> Very important. And now that the knight has landed on c6, now and only now is the move d5 going to be completely devastating. But before we push d5, um, the Russian schoolboy inside of me says, first, let's push this other knight away from b4. You never know when um, this will come in handy. Just get the knight uh, off to the side of the board. Again, if black tries to respond by counterattacking the bishop, we on passant. F5 also, we on passant. <laughs> this pawn on e5 is actually the hero of the position. Now, maybe black will realize that the situation is dire and just leave this knight hanging. Sure. You know, then you're just going to win a minor piece. But in the event of knight a6, it's time for d5. And then the pawn will advance to d6, also with tempo. And black will start dropping loads of material. And I'm not just talking about like a rook or a minor piece. It'll be more than that, trust me. I mean, black is just buried under a pile of rubble here. Buried alive after d6. Okay, knight to d4 is a good attempt by black to get active, but it doesn't really do anything. We can take on d4. There's really no need to do that. You just push d6. Let black be the one to help you involve your queen in the attack. That's it. The game is the game is over. Just take the bishop. Okay, and now don't go bishop g5 because knight takes f3 is a check and we drop the bishop. Instead, you can pick up the pawn on d4, but the kind of positional pedant inside of me says, actually, knight takes d4, queen takes d4 is not the best that white can do. Uh, who can explain why that is? What is the drawback of snapping up this pawn? This is completely pedantic. Everything is totally winning here. Um, but just in general. Yeah, it allows this knight to rejoin the game via c5. There's a little weakness on the b3 square. We'd have to drop our bishop away from the center. Then black's bishop could develop rather than going for an additional pawn. Keep your eyes focused on the d6 and f6 square. That's, that's where the real prize is at. And so knight to c3 comes to mind, trying to expedite the process of getting the knight to one of these squares, keeping this knight out of the game. So I'm assuming the black might go like bishop b7. There we go. Let's trade. Now, of course, it, it's not a bad idea to take on d4. But just out of principle, I'm going to leave that knight on d4 as much as possible because we have two different routes we have b5 and we have e4, and this is the juicier route because we are access. We have access to both of these squares, depending on what black plays. Black castle's king side, obviously we're going to go to f6, which is exactly what happens. We could have also started with bishop g5. That might have won faster, but I'm basically going for checkmate here. Now, finally, I think it's a good, a good moment to take on d4. And the, the missing ingredient here, of course, is our queen. If our queen lands anywhere in this vicinity, we win the game. And so queen to d2 should be obvious to you. Technically, black can prolong the game with rook g8. I hope this doesn't happen. Yeah, because the game isn't interesting anymore. Queen h6. And if black tries to play queen f6, we can actually take the rook with mate. Uh, we don't even need to recapture the queen. So it's mate on the next move. GG. Pretty smooth game. Let me just fast forward a little bit to this moment when we played the move d5. Those of you who are sort of speedrun regulars, there's a particular game that I keep showing. Every, I mean, every speedrun, we have at least one game like this. And there was a game that I played many years ago, and I keep showing this game. Um, and very important kind of tip, sometimes you need to see the same game over and over again uh, until a theme crystallizes in your mind. And that's part of my coaching philosophy. Like sometimes you don't need more than one game to illustrate a theme, but seeing stuff that you already know is a really important part of learning. The game that I'm talking about is this one. Now you're going to see where this is going pretty quickly. So this was an Alapin game where my opponent went for knight c6, which is not a very good move. But instead of transitioning back to one of the main lines with d5, my opponent went e6, which was a clear indicator that he's not, he doesn't really know what he's doing. I started by playing knight f3. He went knight f6. Now a lot of people rush to play e5. 
But this is not the way to maximize White's advantage because after knight d5, you're back in sort of mainline territory. So I developed another piece. And the moment my opponent put his bishop on e7, I got very excited. What did I play in this position? Who can tell me sort of the move and then the idea? And this is almost identical uh, in many ways. Uh, in spirit, not like exactly, but in spirit, this is identical to how the speedrun opponent lost. Yeah, now it's time for d5. My opponent traded and put a knight on b4. Now, what's interesting is that if you play a3 by the same logic that we did it in my speedrun game, actually here a3 is not the most accurate move because of this response, queen to a5. This is an important idea to keep in mind. This queen landing on a5 can be a big reason why a piece from b4 can be hard to chase away. Like you see this a lot in either the Slav or the Nimzo Indian, like totally different opening. You see the same concept where if you sort of fall asleep on what's going on uh, with this pin, suddenly you can find yourself in you know this kind of situation. And this is not a good illustration, but what I'm saying is this idea exists in a lot of different openings. Like the queen lands on a5, reinforcing whatever's happening on the a5 e1 diagonal. Keep an eye out for this type of idea. And so for that reason, I just push d6 right away. If the bishop drops back, there is a check on e2, winning, forcing the bishop to come back to e7. My opponent took on d6, delivered a um, completely irrelevant fork on c2, took the rook, and after I developed my other bishop, uh, he went knight e4 and resigned after rook e1. Rook e1 was literally a pre-move. Okay, not literally. I guess he could have done this, but this is even stronger than taking the knight. Everybody should see why black's position is resignable. The other important game that I've shown many times is another one of my old games, and this illustrates a different theme. This illustrates a different theme. Here we go. Just a moment. This illustrates a different theme. I got yelled at by my coach for this game. And this is even earlier. I was 1,600. So I'm playing a, a guy rated 1,000. Actually, I was facing the Alapin, ironically enough. But that's another irrelevant detail. Just a coincidence. And in this position, I played b6. Now, many of you will have seen this position before. I've shown it several times. This is a huge blunder that could have lost the game on the spot. My opponent did not notice this moment and I went on to win pretty smoothly. What was missed by white? White to play and win. White to play and win. In fact, there's only one winning move. Yes, please take your time. No rush. Mm-hmm. Knight to e5 is correct, and bishop f3 is coming next, regardless of black's response. But the most important detail is that here, the queen is unable to drop back anywhere to protect this bishop because d7 is controlled. This is the reason why you can't move the knight to any old square. Obviously, here the queen can move back to d7. What does this show? This shows you that anytime you feed and keto your bishop, you have to remember that it is a two-move operation. In the span of time before the bishop hits feed and keto, your rook is going to be incredibly vulnerable. Of course, you've seen other instances of a similar concept, such as the old queen's gambit trap, where I don't know actually how many of you will, will have seen this before, but here there is a famous trap where after a4, black can't go c6 because after a, b, c, b, there's the move queen f3 and the rook is trapped. But it's the same concept. You just haven't been able to put your bishop on b7 yet. And that's just a pretty important takeaway, which came in handy in the speed run because precisely the moment that he played b6, precisely that moment on move four, I was already thinking about putting a bishop on the long diagonal and I had made a mental note. So you don't want to go e5 here because it doesn't come with tempo. But the moment he plays knight f6, this move should be kind of on your radar. Then c4, chase the knight away. Here, of course, we can play a3, and then the game is over. The Alapin strikes again. Now I'll say just in closing that c takes d4 is the main line. And here you want to recapture with a pawn. And here the main line is d7, d5. And the one important thing uh, to remember for now, I'm sure we'll face this again, is that you don't want to take on d5 here. You want to push e5. This is the main line. And here it is considered that white is sort of solidly better. I, I don't think that black is able to equalize in this particular line. The one key idea is that after knight to c6, the light skirt bishop belongs on b5 in these positions. First of all, this is not a blunder because queen a5 is met with knight c3. But second of all, the point of this line for white is to eliminate the pressure on the d4 pawn, leaving black with a dud of a dark squirt bishop. 
So for example, after knight f3, bishop to g4, you're actually supposed to voluntarily take on c6, and then to develop the light squared, sorry, the queen's knight to d2. The point being eventually to establish a blockade on the c5 square. So that black is not able in the long run to undo the pawn chain with c6, c5. Black is typically unable to push c5 this early because you just grab the pawn. And in a situation like this, white wins the game by force. Queen a4 check. So like queen a4 check, bishop to d7, and c6. Actually, really important move that makes the line work. Once you're castled and you go knight b3, you can chase the light squared bishop away with h3, and white is better. So this is a very quick sort of elevator pitch. Um, if black does not play d5, which is much more common at the lower levels, well, then you just develop naturally and you have the full center. Okay, guys, one last five-minute game, and then we'll call it a knight. Let's go. Let's jump in and get black here in a king's Indian. Okay, let's go. So we have a Fianchetto. Fianchetto, king's Indian, d6. Okay, so we're clearly facing more serious opposition now. And if you're a King's Indian player, you can expect to start facing more mainstream lines, uh, you know, at the sort of 17, 1800 level. The Fianchetto is often recommended as one of the reliable ways to grab a small but steady advantage in the King's Indian. I don't really think that's true. I think Black has actually several ways to, uh, several compelling ways to fight for equality. And it really depends on what you want, uh, what kind of position you want as Black. Now, I'm going to showcase several ways of responding to the Fianchetto in the speedrun. In this game, I'm going to play the variation that I used uh, to play over the board up until I sort of became an IM. This variation brought me a lot of success. It's got a tremendous amount of practical value. And at this level, it's going to work like a charm. And it's also the sort of traditional way of playing the King's Indian, which of course is to prepare e5. And you do that by playing knight b to d7. Okay, so d5 is not a principal continuation, and it's a little bit premature. White has the cart before the horse, horse because you don't need to play e5 anymore. Basically, the drawback of this move is that the king's Indian bishop is now very happy, and the pawn on d5 can be chipped away at at the right moment, pushing c6. Now, c6 in this position actually loses a pawn, and it's a good idea to figure out why. But one way that we can kind of circumvent the obstacles is to put the knight on b6. Typically, you don't want to do that in the King's Indian, but here, the extenuating circumstances that white is unable to play b3, actually very much on theme because we're able to move this knight away or take on d5. And yeah, it's not so easy for white to defend this pawn. White plays knight b to d2. Now the bishop on c1 is completely locked out. White still can't play b3. And our plan now is going to be to prepare the move c6 and fight for total control over the center. So our move here is very logical. We play bishop to d7. Of course, we create the potential for queen to c8 and bishop h3 as well. Now, if you wanted to make a draw, you could play bishop to f5 and force the rook back to a1. But as a matter of fact, the bishop on f5 can be a pretty misplaced piece because not only can it allow white to push e4 with tempo, but the knight from f3 can sometimes jump to d4 and harass that bishop. Um, we've got a pretty vast choice of moves here, but I like the move a5, preventing white from pushing b4 and encouraging white to play b3, which would be a blunder. Now let's continue with our plan and go c6. We can also play e6 in the future and really put the heat on this pawn. We can also play a4 and put the heat on white's queenside pawn chain, which is what I'm going to, eh, a4, maybe there's b4. Ah, but then we can play cd. I like it. Let's go a4. So notice that we're using our pawns and we keep poking and prodding at white's sort of queenside pawn chain. White's not budging. He's playing really well. I think it's probably a good idea now to play e5, try to shut down this dark squared bishop and get the more traditional king's Indian structure in the center. This is what you should be kind of familiar with. And now you might say, well, should we start preparing f7, f5? Well, it really depends on what white does. White plays b4, trying to shove this pawn down to c5. Let's shove our own pawn up to a3, creating a nice little window of escape for our knight, which we're going to exploit immediately, knight to a4 with tempo. And notice that this pawn tension is um, something that you should monitor because we're going to take on d5 at exactly the most inconvenient moment for white. 
why is this the most inconvenient moment? Well, for two reasons. White's pieces have been really pushed back. And also, no matter how white takes, there's going to be new vistas that are available for our minor pieces. In this case, our bishop has this lovely square. We have also the C file at our disposal. And now it's like pure King's Indian action, where as long as you're activating and improving the activity of one of your pieces, you're doing something right. So I'm going to play this mysterious looking move, knight to g4. What the heck is the point of this move? Can't white just go h3 and chase the knight away? Well, one thing I'm noticing is that the light squared bishop is guarding this f1 square. So I'm actually setting up a really nasty attack on the f2 pawn. Here we can just go queen to b6. And as you can convince yourself, white has no way to defend this pawn without giving up at least an exchange. And that's how quickly this became lost for white. Of course, now you should no notice that h3 is met by knight takes f2 and then queen b6 check. And I'll show you the follow up after the game because the dark squared bishop actually does often get involved, perhaps an unexpected way to those who are not familiar with King's Indian minutia. White is busted here. White is busted here. Okay, now again, you can choose to be pedantic, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to grab a rook while I can. Now, this other knight on a4 can jump into b2. It's probably a good idea to do that because the a3 pawn is hanging. The point of this move is not to really establish an outpost. It's to get white to get rid of the dark squared bishop. Okay, now I think it's a good time to occupy the c file. We can also try to trap the queen, but there's no rush to do that. Let's just get the rook into the action. I'm largely playing instinctively. Yeah, I've given away the pawn, but the moment you've gotten rid of your opponent's dark squared bishop, you should be trying to optimize the activity of your own dark squared bishop. And this can be done by putting the bishop on h6. Very, very typical move in the King's Indian to play bishop h6 at the right moment. Not just when there's a rook on e3, <laughs> in many other situations as well. Now, the c2 square looks very juicy. I'm also keeping an eye on the a file, which we're controlling with our, with our other rook. So, a really sexy retreating move here is queen to a7. Really using every square inch of the of the queen side to our favor. Just look at how white's completely paralyzed here. Rook a1, he's at our mercy. And now, of course, simplification is the order of the day. Let's go queen a3. Looks like it might prolong the game, but in fact, it's going to shorten it. Because without the queen on the board, white's minor pieces are totally incapable of handling the tasks that are in front of them. Our other rook will infilt infiltrate to c2, and something's going to give. Just... Easy moves, no calculation required. Yeah, white's, white's crumbling here on all sides. Now we have another nifty little move. We can play bishop to d3. You might be tempted by this move, but it's just a one-move threat. A niftier way to approach is the position is bishop to e2. Because if we, we can entice this knight away from d2, we'll be able to deliver a check on c1 and pick up white's queen. So we're threatening bishop takes f3. Now, our other rook can also come into c3. So with every move, we're just tightening the screws and tightening the screws. And eventually, white's just going to start losing all of their pieces. OK, time for bishop takes f3. Time to collect the harvest. We can take either minor piece in that position, but let's take bishop on c8. This is just faster. And once again, after knight f3, we can actually take the knight. But rook c1 is perhaps more consistent with our idea. Okay, now I think the simplest by far is simplification. And if you can grab a free pawn making space for the queen, then you should. Bishop takes e4. And swing the queen over to the, the king side. And just like um, I intended, the game ends with a short but sweet king side attack and a rook infiltration on c2. Whew, nice game. A lot of insights that I could share for this game. I don't want to go on for much longer here, so I'm going to cut this pretty short and limit myself to a few kind of high-level remarks. But this is a game that I would definitely encourage you to analyze on your own. Good game to our opponent. Definitely not easy, and I definitely had to huff and puff before the house came down, You know, using both sides of the board, the A and the C file. Um, but just a couple of quick remarks. Now, my sort of quote-unquote official recommendation in the kid is going to be to play C6 and Bishop to F5, but more on this later. Knight b to d7 is an old school move. 
And I will say right away that if white knows reams of theory, like at the GM level in classical chess, white is considered to be better after e5, e4, which is the main line. However, that should not stop you from playing a line at your level, especially if it carries a lot of practical value. My results in blitz, even at my level, are really, really good. And your results in classical with this move can also be fantastic if you learn it well. So the idea of this move is to prepare e5. And the line that I'm going to recommend if white goes into the main line is actually to now play the move c6. And if white responds with the most popular move, we're deploying the queen to a5 in this line. A lot of you might have seen me play this line in Blitz. It carries a tremendous amount of venom, and it's beyond the scope of this game for now. Let's focus on what our opponent actually did, which is d5. Um, it's not a terrible move. It definitely plays right into our hands. And it shows you that in the King's Indian, uh, you can't approach this opening as if it's the London system. Sorry for any London system players, where you can basically play the same moves no matter what black does. A lot of people think that the King's Indian is much the same way. Like in the London, you can make these moves reliably, and you know you're going to be fine. The King's Indian, people think, oh, well, I'm going to play e5 against anything that white does. Now, you should already know that that's not the case, because we've had plenty of games thus far where I was orienting on c5 rather than e5 in some situations. Particularly if white plays b3, in many situations you want to push c5 rather than e5. In the London system, I'm recommending the move c5 on move 2. But also, you should not automatically play e5 in the main lines. Um, here e5 would be a pretty bad move, because white can on passant and provoke you know, serious weaknesses on the king's side, and the e6 pawn can now be attacked. And if you play e5 again, well, I mean, this just just should look very visually unappealing to you. Like, why are you weakening all these light squares? The king is uncomfortable. Knight to g5 is going to be annoying. This is not the way to approach the position. If you play c6 too early, I mentioned that you drop a pawn. How do you drop a pawn? Well, white trades and sticks a knight on d4. And actually, this does equalize for black. Black can sacrifice this pawn with knight e5. And I looked at this with the engine. Turns out that black's peace activity handsomely compensates for uh, the sacrifice pawn. But this is again unnecessary when knight b6 is a perfectly sufficient and very easy to learn option. And after knight b to d2, bishop d7 prepares the move c6. Probably c6 straight away at this point is a slightly more accurate move. And the point is that if white does the same thing, knight to d4, we play bishop to b7, and believe it or not, you're not even sacrificing a pawn. Uh, because if white takes on c6, the queen slides up to c7, and Actually, queen to d7 apparently is a better move, hitting the knight. The knight has to move away. Yeah, technically you've sacrificed a pawn, but just look at the disparity in peace activity. White is in huge trouble. This pawn can hardly be defended. If white plays b3, you can blast open the center. There's going to be tactics along the main long diagonal. White is borderline lost here, actually, if he just grabs the pawn. So actually, c6 can be played right away, but there's nothing wrong with preparing it an extra time with bishop to d7. White plays rook b1. Here, I resisted the urge to play bishop f5. Oftentimes, if you have a move like this, and you can tell that your opponent is missing it, it can be good to keep it in reserve. Because what I did is I tried to provoke white into playing b3. Now bishop f5 would be much stronger, because the rook is literally trapped. If it slides back into the corner, knight takes d5 as a simple tactic, exposing a discovered attack on the rook. Rook to b2, we can slide the knight back or forward, and in all cases, the rook is once again trapped. So a5, of course, very typical move in the king's Indian, grabbing space and preventing b4. Um, my opponent dodged some of these bullets early on, but the moment when things really crumbled for white, I actually think he played really well for a long time. I think the serious mistake was actually b4, because when I played e5, I created the positional threat of c takes d5. And you might be like, well, I don't really get it. Why is c takes d5 not a good idea? you know, in this position. And the reason is that white can play e takes d5, and this e7 pawn is a backward pawn. And white has the d4 square at his disposal, which is important because anytime the bishop lands on f5, white is going to have this really nasty idea of sticking a knight on d4. In addition, white can use that square for the bishop as well. And apart from that, anytime you try to play e5, now, of course, white will play on passant. So I actually think when I played e5, white should have taken on passant. Um, and the position remains very double-edged. I would have taken back with a bishop. I like black's position. 
but white also is really, really solid after something like knight to d4. It's just a very double-edged position. Like you can go rook e8, you can pressure the e pawn, but both sides have their chances here. Um, as soon as white played b4, I drove the pawn down to a3. He allowed another tempo move, which makes things even worse. And now after cd, the situation has changed completely. Because here, if white plays e takes d5, we play bishop f5. And you can just see visually how different the situation is. Rook c1, you can still stick a knight on b2. Then you can actually slide the queen over to e8 and deploy it to a4. And the b4 pawn is going to be very vulnerable. And you're certainly not afraid of white pushing c5. White just doesn't have the ability to keep these center pawns protected, especially when the queens get taken off the board. So the presence of this pawn on e5 makes all of the difference. Really interesting to observe how pawns can really be the soul of the game. The way that our opponent recaptured just allows all of our pieces to jump into the game. And the final point I wanted to make is that in this position, we deliver a check on b6. It's not mate. White can block with a rook. And this would make a lot of people refrain from sacrificing the knight. How should black proceed? Final question before I wrap up for the knight. What should black play? It's a slight trick question. It's not what you might think. It's not what you might think. So the best move, yes, bishop h6 is winning, but it doesn't lead to the desired results if you simply take the rook. Because at the end of the day, white has two pieces for a rook, and actually here white is better. So the correct approach is to combine. You can start with bishop h6, but that is not even necessary, f5. Finally, it's time for this move. And white is totally helpless against the threat of f4, just winning the rook uh, entirely. So that was kind of the concept. But the way that our opponent played, uh, of course, once I activated all of my heavy pieces, eventually the bishop entered the, the fray with bishop h6. And, you know, another good takeaway is that bishop h6 is a very typical move in the King's Indian, uh, especially when the center is closed and your dark scored bishop is just staring at the pawn on e5. Often that bishop can be really deployed in a variety of interesting ways. Or traded off for white's dark squared bishop. Uh, also very typical is to trade off your dark squared bishop for your opponent's dark squared bishop and provoke a lot of these dark square weaknesses on the king's side. So for example, in this game, just a moment, in this game, uh, which I played a while back, not really a good illustration, but you can see the point. I played this interesting King's Indian line where the bishop goes to f8, then around to e7, and then I play bishop g5 trying to trade off those bishops. There's also a really good illustrative example from a completely different opening. So this is essentially a reverse King's Indian. That's how you should think of it, what you're about to see. Let's change the players. Pickett, who's a very strong Dutch GM, he employs a really instructive idea here with white. He plays f4 which is the standard move. And after f6, final moment for today, what did white play in this position? Now, the theme of these last two examples has not really been to involve the light squared bishop. It's been to trade it. But still, I think the point is the h3 or h6 squares are very important jumping off points for that king's Indian bishop. It doesn't always remain on the g7 square. Yeah, so here white did not play f5, which is what most people think, because this bishop is going to forever remain remain imprisoned, he played bishop h3, using some simple tactics and getting rid of the bishops. Queen h5 check picks up the bishop, and now look at these light squares in, in black's territory. Immediately, white jumps in to e6 with his queen. Really kind of good to know that this bishop, this dark square bishop, is oftentimes the unsung hero of black's position. Here, I deployed it very straightforwardly, used the open files on the queen side, and I really think the interplay between the bishops was kind of instructive in this game. There's more to talk about, but I'm out of gas, and I think I think it's enough for one episode. So we'll have plenty more King's Indian games, so you shouldn't feel like you're, you know, I won't try to capture all of the detail at once. It's impossible to learn this opening, you know, in, in five minutes. You need to to do it slowly and through the lens of a lot of a lot of games and a lot of failures. Thanks everybody. I'll see you guys later. Thanks for hanging out.